thank you, Audrey. Thanks for the invitation. I'm really happy to be here. It's a beautiful campus on a beautiful day, so could, couldn't ask for more. And thank you all for coming. Uh, so what I would like to suggest up, uh, coming right up front is if you have any questions, then interrupt me, and then we can have more of a dialogue than a talk. And then we, if we run out of time at the end with slides, then we'll, I don't know, hustle up or something. So, all right. So talk about beautiful campuses. I'm from the University of New Hampshire, and I briefly wanted to show you our campus. Uh, let me see how the audio works, because there's actually some audio with it. Let's see, is this? Yeah, okay. So, give this a try. Here's a video. You don't have to visit the University of New Hampshire to see what we yeah. do. You can see it in our state's coastline, in our farms and forests, and our towns and cities. This is where you'll see the things we do that touch the lives of people throughout the state. For 150 years, UNH has been proudly protecting our resources and powering the state's economy. We are more than a campus. We are the University of New Hampshire, the state's flagship research university. Probably would fit in, in Canada, wouldn't it? I mean, with all the stuff that we do. So, hockey, big, big sport, right? Okay. And then, of course, uh, I'll, I'll present some of the work that was done in my lab, as well as an overview of, of sort of the broader picture of automobile, you know, cars and in-vehicle interactions. And this is members of my lab, so of course the, the work that I'll be presenting here is, is uh, something that we did in collaboration. All right, so if you think of cars, you can probably think of both change and continuity in terms of the user interfaces, right? So for pretty much as long as we've had cars, we've had steering wheels and there were some sort of little gadgets to tell us, speedometers, right, those sorts of things, pedals. But then there's a lot of change as well. And if you get into the car, a car that was built today, you'll literally have something along the lines of 200 different buttons. And, you know, Joanne can tell us probably more about that. But the fact is that that's a really big change. And then another big change that happened, I think, is that we have built-in uh, devices as well, right? So as user interface designers, I think we'll, we're really facing this very interesting issue of, well, how do you deal with all of this? It brings value, but then it's also a set of challenges. And to me, it feels like a very novel challenge, and certainly these pictures from you know, 20, 1923 and 2013 would indicate that it is new, but then relatively recently, I, I read this book called uh, Business Adventures, 12 Classic Tales from the World of Wall Street by John Brooks. And these are 12 tales from the 1950s, 1960s, Wall Street business stories. And they're truly interesting, but one thing that really caught my eye is the story of the Ford Etzel. So perhaps you've heard of the Ford Etzel, right? It's a car that Ford spent $250 million developing. And of course, you look at the date and you realize that $250 million was an enormous amount of money at the time. Uh, you can also look at the dates and realize that they were not successful. This car was on the market for something like two to three years and failed. So, of course, the story is about that. The story is about how is it possible to spend this much money and still basically lose all that money and not make it. However, what I thought was interesting is that as people reviewed it, they said things like the epitome of the push-button era. Right, so when you think about novel things that we have, that we're experiencing today, well, they felt that, that same way too. So here are all those push buttons that were really a novelty at the time. Interestingly, these particular push buttons were apparently so easy to, to switch that you could take a toothpick and make them flip, which is completely unclear to me why that's a good thing in a car. But there you go. It was a selling point, I guess. And they, someone called it a devilish assemblage of, assemblage of gadgets. Anyway, I thought this was really interesting because in a sense, even though we are experiencing change, realistically, humanity has been experiencing change all along, right? And uh, we're in one of those times when, when change is happening. So let me say a couple of words about some work that we've done. This was uh, something that wrapped up maybe about, uh, well, five or six years ago now. But who had, who had a chance to sit in a police cruiser? <laughs> Front, back, I'm not going to discriminate. I'm sure it was all for a good reason. But if you sit in a police cruiser, you'll probably notice that it's a very busy environment, right? There is a ton of equipment in it. And uh, actually, I'm not quite sure how police works in Canada, but in the United States, everybody has a police. Is that the same here too? The town has a police, the county has a police, the university has a police, the railroad system that runs through our town has a police, and then you have all the other first responders. So it's really, really cut up, which at times you really appreciate, by the way. And um, 
The fact is that it's also a really small market. When we started this, this is supposed to be Project 54, this effort. Um, the um, market for new vehicles, this was 1999, was 15 million new vehicles in the United States, 150,000 new police cars. So that means you have about 1% of the market. Therefore, Ford will sell you any color, any kind of car you'd like, as long as it's a Ford Crown Victoria and it's black. Right? That's what you could get. If you're buying a police cruiser, you're getting a black Crown Victoria at the time. There is no choice. That's what you get. And then small companies come in relatively small companies because it's a small it's a small market and they bring in their radar their lights their computer systems that maybe tie into some back-end uh, system and so forth so what's the problem with small companies well one problem with small companies is that uh, or really many companies is they don't want to open up their system because they're worried about competition kind of stealing their ideas so you have many tiny companies that all have their proprietary systems that are completely closed boxes Right? And so if you're a police department and you buy all these things, they don't talk to each other. That's one big problem. And when the company goes out of business, you're stuck with things that you simply cannot operate. So the Project 54 system integrates or integrated devices and police cruisers into a single system. And in fact, it was quite a big um, effect, relatively speaking. It was about 1,000 vehicles on the road, mostly in New Hampshire. And the system on the inside looked like this. So it was a PC-based system. You had a touch screen as well as a microphone that, that uh, strip there is a microphone with a push to talk button. And so you could issue commands like, you know, change the radio channel to XYZ, or, you know, what is the information on, on uh, plate number 2468. And so, uh, you know, we, we were quite pleased with this and police were really pleased with this. And in fact, at lunch, uh, one of the issues that, that uh, came up with that, that, that was related to this is one thing that, for example, New Hampshire State Police did at our uh, suggestion is to say, any vendor who's going to sell to us, we don't really want you to just tell us what the secrets are inside of whatever it is that you're doing. But you have to give us interfaces, meaning software and hardware interfaces that we can tie into. So if you're going to give us a box that does X, you need to give us a way to plug into it and connect it to the Project 54 software system so that we can make you know, voice commands, or we can issue some sort of commands and, and query whatever it is that you're doing and get feedback. Uh, so we were talking about open sourcing, right, and how open source might work really well for certain things so that people can access it freely. And that's certainly one way to go, but in a sense, what they really cared about is to make sure that they can access the data, they can get the information back and forth between these devices. I wanted to say a couple words about the speech interface because that's one of the things that I was really most excited about. And here's a paper from 2013 where we uh, put up some data about evaluating how uh, police officers in the New Hampshire State Police used the speech interface and other interfaces in the car. So first, uh, I'm showing you this graph to show you how many vehicles were on the road at any given time between, let's say, 2003 and 2013. So you see that it rose up to, well, you don't see it because it's missing here, but it's about 200 vehicles. And um, that's on a daily basis. And we're picking one part of that. Uh, so between uh, January 2009 and November 2011. So what, that's a nice stable time when roughly the same amount of cars were on the road. And we're asking the question, the, what is the average number of speech commands per day? So things like change the radio channel, turn on the lights, give me information on a plate or a driver's license. And you see the 95th, 90th, 80th, and 70th percentiles of users. So the blue line tells you the top 5% of users how many uh, commands. And now, because you don't see the left side of it, it's about 25. It's roughly 25 commands a day. So the, the top 5% of users would issue about 25 speech commands a day. And then the bottom 70 would basically not issue any, right? So the, vast ma the majority of people didn't use it. And then the top 5% used it about 25 times a day. Now, of course, the question is, what do police officers do? And a lot of police officers don't really do much in their car. Right? They might be driving from point A to point B, and they have work at point A, and they have work at point B, but not much in between. Whereas other police officers might be 
waiting to find out if you're driving too fast and if you are driving too fast they might pull up behind you and check your license plate before they do pull you over just to make sure that the car is registered and you seem to be an okay person to talk to and those sorts of things. So part of the reason that this is happening is that and then perhaps another part is that maybe they didn't always find it useful. As you might expect uh, we also looked at what they used it for and turns out queries is the big winner here. People really, when they try to access remote databases, things like what is, you know, is this car registered? That's where speech was really useful because these are really long commands, right? Uh, they, you have to fill out basically a form, right? What's the state, what's the license plate number and so forth. On the other hand, things like, uh, you know, switching your lights on and off, that's muscle memory, right? You reach over, you flip a switch and that's much, much quicker than, than having to do uh, than having to use speech. So again, if you are going to run queries, then perhaps the system is really good for you, right? But then again, if, if your job does not include pulling people over and getting the, that information, then maybe not. Okay, so, you know, the theme of the talk today is work. So I think that it's really exciting to think about all these niche applications in terms of work. So for example, first responders are people who work in their cars today. Right? Police officers, uh, 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 ambulance drivers and, and people who work in ambulances, uh, the fire department, right? These are workers who cannot do their work without their vehicles today. You and I, well, at least myself, right? I could definitely get, a lot, get, get by without working in my car. Uh, on the other hand, as we move on through the talk, there are some exciting opportunities with automation, I think, that, that are going to be coming up. Now, how would you evaluate things that happen in the car. I don't know how many people are familiar with the work of John Sanders, but I wanted to show you a neat video because one way to evaluate, you know, people evaluate driving in various ways, but mostly it's your performance. How well are you doing with the driving task? And then physiological measures, you know, are you getting more excited? Are people's dilating? Those sorts of things. And then people use subjective measures. How are you doing? Are you paying attention to this? Did you see this? Did you see that? Now, John Sanders, uh, I, I really love this picture. This was taken in 2017 at the Driving Assessment Conference where he gave uh, a keynote. And you can see that there are no slides in the back and that's because, not because I missed the slides, it's because he didn't have any. So he was actually giving a 30 minute talk without a single slide. And I don't know if Joanne, you were there, but it was rapt attention, right? 30 minutes of people just paying attention. So it was, he was a fantastic speaker. And by the, at this point, he was in his 90s. Uh, so he was an extremely uh, powerful speaker. Very, very fun to see. One of the things that he's known for in our community is this idea that you can evaluate the difficulty of the driving task itself. So how hard is it to drive on a particular road using the so-called occlusion method? And the occlusion method is the following. Imagine you're driving and then I put something in front of you so you cannot see the road. Could you still drive? Could you? For a while, right? And it depends. If, you're, uh, if there's a curve, you probably couldn't. And if you know that there's a curve because it's difficult, then you might say, open up. And so perhaps what I say is, here, I'm going to close your vision for a while and then push a button whenever you need to look. And I'll give you half a second to look while you're doing that. Okay, so that's the occlusion method. So instead of me telling you about it, hopefully we can have John Sanders tell you about it in his own words. And if you're familiar with the Boston area, then take a look at the video and where this is happening. Well, and into this kind of business is the unusually cognitive atmosphere and the interest in ideas. But their work isn't all just work, as shown by this experiment on the attention span needed for safe driving. The experimenter is against director, psychologist John Sanders. Driving along the section of Route 128, and I'm trying to get an estimate of the demand I vote by this particular section of road. The speed of the car is constant, and as the road varies from moment to moment in the demand that it makes upon me, I must look more often or less often, as the case may be. The visor that completely includes my view during the period that it's down, and I must rely on some scored image or memory of what the road was before the visor went down. The half-second look that I have is enough to restore the 
So what do you think? Driving around the 128 loop around Boston if you ever visited. Yeah. <laughs> Exciting. I'm not sure we, sh we could do this today. <laughs> um, but it's really brilliant, isn't it? It's a brilliant way to measure how difficult the road itself is. And of course then, on top of the road, comes any type of work that you might wish to do. Clearly this is manual driving, so there's no automation involved here, right? And pretty soon we're going to start talking about automation. But even then, uh, the road difficulty is a big deal because uh, cars that are going to be automated in the near future will only drive in an automated fashion for relatively short periods of time and then they'll give you back the driving task and probably at difficult points in time. Now when do you think automation will be on our roads as in you let go of the car and then the car drives itself? Any suggestions? From, I don't know, never to it can parallel park. Very good point. Anyway, it's a tough one, right? Now, I, I like this picture because this is a, one of my, uh, a recent book I read, Isaac Asimov, Caves of Steel, talks about Earth about a thousand years from today, and people are afraid of robots. And uh, what happens with automation in a thousand years, we have no idea. But one really interesting thing to me, again, was the people in this, in this book jump into their cars and drive. So a thousand years from today, in, in this particular book, in their vision, people still drive, and just like you and I do. That's kind of curious. I'm not sure. I, I suspect, you know, my answer to my own question is, it's definitely going to be less than a thousand years that we're going to have decently automated vehicles. I don't know when, but I don't think it's going to take us a thousand years, but that's my opinion. Now, I really like this video, too, and I'm going to give you the audio with it, too, but, you know, as far as automated cars and what people think might happen, here's a couple things that people really care about for automated driving, right? Safety, first of all, because there's this promise that automated vehicles will be better than people at driving. Then there is also the fact that we might be able to utilize our infrastructure better. More fewer, you know, sorry, uh, more cars should fit into a smaller place just because they can talk to each other and better utilize space. So take a look at what this person's vision of, or, or vision of this is. So. So this is a video that you can download, Fernando Lifshitz, and um, I think you saw all those elements, right? First of all, safety, no one got hurt. People actually didn't have to pay attention very much, which is also potentially a neat thing as far as you might be able to work. And then cars really, and, and bicycles and everything, you know, they really use the road. By the way, it also, now that I've been to Utrecht and Holland, where you know, there are bicyclists and pedestrians and, and cars in sort of the same spaces. I'm not quite sure if this is about automation or Utrecht, but that's sort of a separate thing. I don't know, if, have people been to the Netherlands? What do you think? Bicycles? And kind of crazy, right? I mean, they, they don't really care about pedestrians. Anyway, there's still a long ways to go before 
automation actually gets there, right? So this is a couple years ago. Someone left one of these, whatever you call them, right? And the only job it had is just stay, but it can't quite do that, right? So automation is not quite there yet. We realize it, but it's coming. And here's one neat thing. Here's the promise of automation and automated vehicles from, uh, oh, it's, a, it's a Kai paper tw from 2019. The, the first author's last name is Stevens. And Stevens, so 2018, there's, imagine this, right? 2018, this person is driving to work. They have to get up, eat breakfast before, you know, right around 8 a.m. They travel and they stay from 9 to 5. They travel home and then they relax and have dinner and so forth. Now, in an automated vehicle where they might be able to actually do work as well, a couple things happen. Um, they might still leave at the same time, but they might travel for longer because while they're in the automated vehicle, they might have their breakfast and they might start working, right? So you perhaps can live further out because the car ride is just not that bad anymore, right? Because you can be driven automatic in an automated vehicle. Um, at the end of it, you're also going to have that longer period of time, but you can actually still work and maybe put some of this relaxation in here. And now look, there is time for sports before dinner, right? Because notice that overall, the beginning and end of travel is actually shorter, even though the travel itself is longer and the work itself is longer too, right? So is this exactly how it's going to play out? Well, who knows, right? But the point is, by providing this automation and allowing people to do things that are not driving in the car, you do open up some interesting opportunities. For example, for being more productive, which perhaps means longer work hours. And perhaps people say, wait a minute, now my employer is going to ask me to work even while I'm driving. I don't want to do that. I want to listen to my music. Fair enough. And that's sort of a political question, right? Or that's a worker's right question. That needs to be resolved. But in this happy scenario, you en ended up relaxing more and having you know, time for sports, even though you were actually more productive too. So I think what's nice is that we do have this vision and there is something to, that we might be able to build towards. Realistically though, this is the state of the art. So this is me sitting in a bus or a chair is behind us taking a picture of me as we're preparing a proposal for a work in cars workshop at Automotive UI, right? So basically you're sitting with your laptop kind of in a really uncomfortable position on a bus or whatever it might be. And by the way, this truly is the state of the art and we know because here we have an Uber commercial. You can pay for Uber Black. And what do they show you? A really comfortable car where basically you are typing, calling, and maybe using your, your, uh, your tablet, right? So this is basically it. What you can do as far as work today, even when you're being driven by a chauffeur, is that. Now, here's another Uber commercial, which I actually really like to show because it shows something completely different, right? So Martha Stewart promotes Uber. And what she is doing in this picture, is she's actually making a cake. There is also a cool looking printer that does things, right? These are not things that we do today in the car. And so one of the things that I'm really uh, curious about is, well, how could we get to that point? How could we get to the point where we can actually think about, uh, you know, doing things that we can do today? What are those ideas that automated vehicles will allow you to do? So we asked this question through uh, a uh, feasibility study. We ran a, uh, an MTurk study. And through this, we had a about 200 people, and we asked them things like, well, what do you do right now in the car, and what would you like to see uh, happening in the future? And um, here are some of the answers. So what work activities do people do while commuting today? So people read emails, people reply to emails, they think, they make phone calls. Uh, unnervingly, they do programming. I don't know how that works out. Uh, and then we also looked at what work would people like to do well in the self-driving vehicles versus what they currently do. So we asked something along the lines of, imagine you have a really safe, perfectly safe automated vehicle. What is it that you would like to do? And you know, more reading emails, more replying to emails, perhaps fewer phone calls, less thinking and reflecting, and less planning. I, I would like to ask you, what would you do? So imagine you have a perfectly safe car. 
And uh, what is it that you might wish to do if it's driving you and you don't have to worry about driving, at least for a, some time? I would have thought more of the key reflection, to be honest. More time to, because when you are driving, you're thinking, but then suddenly you're able to stop and start driving again. So distracting to have that. So I would have thought, having none of that, you could just sit and actually think more deeply about something. I, it's an interesting thing that you bring up. So one of our, our colleagues, Rafaela Sadoun, uh, she is an economist uh, at Harvard, and she happens to be an expert on CEO time use. And in fact, one of the things that CEOs tell her they miss is that time to reflect. So an interesting question. Will, will this, how will this depend on, on uh, who exactly is answering the question? I think that's, a, that's another interesting question here. Yeah? Wouldn't it be the same as what you do on the bus or the train now? That's a really, this is a really, really good question. So we're actually hoping to run experiments exactly looking at that. And certainly people have asked, asked uh, uh, people on trains. Um, there are a couple of things that are worth mentioning. Uber and trains are definitely not private, right? So that's a, the privacy issue of, of whether you're willing to share things or simply even talk versus yourself in your own car. So that's one thing. And I think one very important other issue is that in the short run, uh, automated vehicles will not be all that great and for ha perhaps as you drive into Carlton there might be a segment of the road for 15 minutes where it works really well and then it says you know what you have 30 seconds and you need to take back control because due to whatever it is construction or happens to be regulations or whatever it is it, it has to be a manually driven car now and so that means that also reduces the, the number of things that you can possibly do the fact that you have to come back to the task and then the length of time that you're allowed to come, come back to the task will, will probably constrain things that you can and cannot do. You can't sleep, right? Uh, that's, an, that's an exaggeration, but a lot of people wouldn't mind sleeping. So for example, on the flight over from Boston this morning, I try to take a nap. But I, you know, if, I'm, if I'm in a self-driving car that's going to give me 30 seconds or even less, uh, I can't take a nap. So Go ahead. For your first point, though, yeah. so you're taking it as a constraint that you're in a car alone or with people that you don't mind seeing private stuff? That seems like a, a, a relatively strong constraint. I think, you're, I, I think so, right? So people, what, what you do on a train uh, or on a bus is probably different than what you'd be willing to do in the privacy of your own vehicle, right? So you might, I might, in my car, I might very well run a, a video conference even with augmented reality and avatars and so forth, then I probably won't do that on a train just because it's crazy to, I mean, if everybody did it, it would be too loud. And also socially might be unacceptable for me to wave even though people can't see what I'm waving at. Uh, not to mention actual security question, issues like I work for company X and persons from company Y are sitting behind me, so that's not good. Right, but I mean, what I was thinking though, is that if you take the self-driving car proposition yes. as being less about making you productive and more about providing massively distributed um, uh, micro mass transit, yeah. then those aren't so relevant. Um, okay. I guess I'm not quite following you there, but... Well, the, the proposition for self-driving vehicles mm -hmm. Okay. One of the propositions that's advanced is that it's a f is that it opens up a form of massively distributed, small scale mass transit. Sure. Right. Yeah. In which case, the privacy wouldn't be part of the bracketing of that proposition. Because other people might get into your car. You mean? Yeah. 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 No, I agree. So, so definitely, you're right. So it depends. Maybe you pay more for the privilege of of riding in a a pod that's just for you and pay less, just like today, right? You could actually have a shared Uber or a, a single Uber, even though the driver's still there. So yeah, I, I agree, I agree. Okay, well, um, with a couple of colleagues, actually five different universities, uh, we have a, a nice uh, project where we're exploring this idea of, of working in vehicles. And a couple of slides here show our ideas of, of what this might look like. So first of all, we think that three interesting technologies can come together to really provide tools 
and create this work workplace in an automated vehicle. One is augmented reality. So in this case, our driver has these augmented reality glasses, and those project something about perhaps a phone meeting, right? Might be things like, you know, you're talking, there's recording going on, and perhaps some, some text or, or certain images that are relevant, that are relevant to this uh, conversation. We really think that speech interfaces will be quite useful. So uh, things like uh, uh, having a personal assistant that is speech-based, in fact, uh, I'm just familiar with Microsoft's relatively new uh, Cortana uh, email assistant that's supposed to be, actually it's an email, but you say, hey, Cortana, set up, an email for, uh, set up a meeting for me with these people, and then that software program goes out and emails different people and tries to set, you know. And then uh, tangible interfaces, which, which uh, might be near and dear to, to the hearts of many people here, but what about relatively small physical objects that can either be used as a way to input or gain information from the system? And this is in contrast to a laptop, right? We saw that video of Uber, and here you have a laptop, which is okay, but that does become a projectile, doesn't it, in the case of a, uh, a crash? And there's really no way for you to stow it quick enough. And by quick enough, I mean last year, Audi showed off their 2019 A8 which actually, they said, has a what's called a level three automation. Level three automation is such that you can truly take your hands off the wheel, not use the pedals, not even look at the road, until you're told to come back, and you're given a reasonably long enough time, which obviously is up for interpretation, but their interpretation is 10 seconds. Beep, 10 seconds later, it's all you, right? Well, 10 seconds is too short to, to stole your laptop, isn't it? By the time you do these things and look, th there's just not enough time, especially since the 10 seconds are also there for you to kind of reacquaint yourself with what's going on, which is difficult enough for the car not to be able to drive itself, right? So it's not a simple situation. So in contrast to having those large objects, how about having something small? So these three technologies, augmented reality, speech, and then tangible interactions, hopefully come together. And now we mentioned this, right? They ha this has to be safe. So when you're actually driving, these technologies need to be stowed and then ideally actually supporting the driving task. So for example, augmented reality can be used as navigation tools, speech can be still used as navigation and so forth. One thing that my students and I are really excited about exploring is this idea that the sw these switches between non-driving to driving and back to non-driving are not binary. It's not like now you're not driving, now you are driving, and now you're back to not driving, but rather there's this interleaving that goes on. So perhaps you have a self-interruption or the car tells you, look, you need to come back to driving even though you're doing something else. Well, there will be certain steps and you're gonna go back and forth between those two tasks and ultimately you're gonna end up driving and hopefully not still working on that task. But then there's also gonna be interleaving when the car says, okay, my turn, again, you can feel free to do whatever you need to do. Actually, I'm really excited about this because this gives you the opportunity, hopefully, to affect this. You really worry about safety here, right? This is a safety issue. At the beginning, where the car says, it's your turn, you should really stop what you were doing, pay attention to the road, and take over driving. And the concern is that people will not do this fast enough or with full enough attention. But what if people knew that they can it's okay to stop the work they're doing because at the tail end of it, when they come back to it, there's going to be someone to help them. Someone to help them bring them up to speed. So if I'm driving and I have a human next to me, that human will say, okay, go ahead and drive. And then when I'm stopped with that driving, they'll say, okay, well, here's where we were. Remember we talked about this, we did this, you said this, you said that, and I'm relatively quickly back to speed. Of course, that's not usually the case when I have to take my laptop out and look at where my paper stands right now. I have to kind of do all of that work myself. So I think that's an, important, that's an exciting opportunity for us to do some, some really neat research and, and uh, uh, make a difference there. And Having said all this, I, I'm going to slowly wrap up, but one thing that we have to be really careful about is remember that slide where I showed that people might drive for longer periods of time? Well, there's some basic ergonomics problems here, right? Sitting for long periods of time is not necessarily good for you, and in a vibrating environment, even less so, and if you're reaching for things, even less so, right? So there's, very, there's lots of work on this, also including in the car. So for example, this paper by Magnuson and Pope talks about how uh, uh, drivers 
might experience lower back pain, shoulder pain, neck pain, as it relates to, first of all, just long periods of time being in the car, and also the vibrations. So as we design and get excited about, oh boy, people can drive for longer periods of time, this is great, they won't be bored, they'll be so productive, we really have to make sure that they're actually healthy as well, right? So this is something to keep in mind. All right, so let me slowly wrap up, and um, hopefully this was a, a, a brief overview of working in cars over time, right? So we started out with talking about manually driven cars, and of course working in cars at that point, you know, comes down to phone calls. But today, we really do see a promise. Things are coming along, and uh, you do actually, you're able to do some simple office tasks, and we see what people tell us they do right now, and then we also have high hopes for tomorrow. We kind of can tell what people would like to do more or less of, but really we can even see beyond that, right? We think that, well, people might think they want to do more email, but we're also excited about these other opportunities that perhaps they're not aware of that they might be able to do. However, we have to pay attention to things like uh, ergonomics, safety, we just talked about that, right? We talked about privacy. I didn't even mention motion sickness, but I don't know how many of you get motion sick if you look down in the back seat at, at your car, at your, uh, at your book, right? And a lot of people simply cannot do that. A lot of people have to drive, and that's, that's the position they have to be in. And then there are various levels, and all of us get affected depending on how long we do it and how, what the environment is, how, vib how much vibration. But there are clearly things that, that need to be overcome before any of this can become a reality. Okay, so hopefully you have any, some other questions, and um, either now or later. So thank you for your attention. Yeah. So the only thing that I can find wrong with this car, if it's intelligent enough to drive on the road, why is it not intelligent enough to pull up at the side of the road and give you more time to adjust instead of just giving you 10 seconds? I, I think you're absolutely right. So, um, you know, in the short run, the you do have a, I think the automation is still limited and it's limited in the sense that you know if you imagine driving on a I don't know if it, do you have high occupancy vehicle lanes right so you have the single lane uh, both sides have a barrier and cars are all driving in one direction no pedestrian traffic honestly it's not that complicated of a controls problem right just don't hit the thing in front of you or to the left or to the right and so I think that people can actually make cars now that do this really well. Unfortunately, uh, and um, you know, from the, from the perspective of how this is regulated, we have other people who can answer this better than I can. But realistically, there are, there are limitations to what the technology can do. And I think there are also limitations to what the technology is willing to try to do for fear of, either because of regulation or for be fear of being sued. So they say, look, I'm gonna pull over. This is the best I can do. If you don't take over in 10 seconds, we will pull over, right? And we'll stop. Which, by the way, is not a very good solution, right? If you're going 60 miles an hour and then you stop on a road that everybody's going 60 miles an hour, that actually is a, that's a safety concern, right? And presumably what is unsafe for this car is unsafe for the other cars as well. Correct. And I think that what we, what we have come to expect reasonably, uh, with, with good reason, is that uh, humans can handle it. Right? But unfortunately, for various reasons, automation cannot. For example, there sens you know, sensors that automation uses fail in certain conditions that human eyes and just in general senses don't fail. Right? So simply automation will, you know, some sc scenarios of snow, right, will cover your lane markings and oops, you know, no more, no more lane markings. What are you going to do? You can't use your automation necessarily, for example. Right? So go ahead. Sorry, I, I, it's You're going to save me now. Thank you. No, I'm <laughs> sorry. If you want to oh, go, oh, sorry. So, but does that make sense or is that well, not? I'm just thinking, unless it's something wrong with the car itself, yeah. it's not the only one that is in danger. The whole, all the cars in that lane are, are also in the same situation. So. Well, I think, I think the short answer to that that I can think of is that um, your sensors and your automation, the, the system that you've built, is basically you know, you're exceeding its limits. For example, your, your sensors, for, for whatever reason, can't see as well as they should in order for your controls to actually work properly. So think of snow that covers up your lane markings. Uh, there might be, you know, if it's a vision-based system, rain, I think, also isn't very healthy for it with reflection and nighttime, you know, those sorts of things. Yeah. 
I was really interested in the discussion about what people will want to do in the yeah. parks and the idea that some people might want to have more time to think and others wouldn't. What I would like to have when I'm driving along is some wonderful interface so as I come up with some great idea, I can capture it perfectly yes. in some way. And I, I don't know what that would be yet, but it's got to be some sort of way that it's not just text. Yes. It has to be, I'm not sure. But I think that would be quite exciting to be able to capture really wonderful ideas when you're driving along or in a car and along that maybe you would be interacting in some totally different way. Yeah. Um, I really like that. and uh, it's. It's a little related to one of the things I'm really interested in too is is marking up uh, you know audio. So uh, I like to listen to audiobooks, but it's really impossible to mark it up. You cannot highlight a sentence in an audiobook, so you literally have to stop and you transcribe it or do something, right? So so that I think it's not ex yours is broader. Like mental post-it. Yeah. Yeah. And it's also interesting because well, at least marking up is there's a delay, right? So you think, and then the, it's complicated. So I don't know how that would work out with ideas. I guess you could perhaps verbalize them, or yeah, yeah. So <clears throat> I, mean, I could be wrong, but I'm assuming there are really two main reasons why we're interested in and uh, look forward to semi-automated and automated cars. One, as noted earlier, is that this should help us with mass mass transit, uh, the environment, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. The other one is that, <coughs> the second reason, is that humans are terrible at operating complex things. Yeah. We're terrible drivers in, in some ways. I mean, we can, we can be terrible. Uh, we can make, make lots of accidents. And, lot. and we're assuming that these automated and semi-automated vehicles are going to help us um, in the sense of driving should be safer and, and better. But the problem is you pointed out today is that the human has to come in and out of the loop with the yeah. vehicle. So I'd like to ask you to talk a little, a little more about, about how, how we would do that, um, especially in the face of the fact that <clears throat> as we get more and more automation, our driving skills will presumably deteriorate um, uh, from, you know, <laughs> somebody, because we're driving less. Yeah. And, uh, so now our ability to go in and out of a system might get better because yeah. we have to, but so what, what types of things are you looking at or are people looking at to help us um, bring people in and out of the loop? Minimally, I think that's one question. And the other question is, yeah. how is that going to change as our skills and understanding of the driving environment deteriorate? Yeah, I think those are excellent questions, both of them. Bringing you back into the loop uh, is, we know it's hard and we know that it doesn't, you know, there's good data uh, that not having been in the loop affects your driving for a period of time, right? On the order of, say, a minute at least, in at least one study, right? Uh, so we know that it's problematic. And I don't, I don't think I have an answer to that. I think that my uh, hypothesis, if you will, is that this idea of augmented reality hopefully can help with that. Reason being that if you don't place visual uh, information away from the road, but rather overlay it with the road, then ideally you're, well, I don't know how well, you know, what's the percentage of, you know, what, what is it that, how do you call this, right, that you have your understanding of what the traffic situation is and what the road geometry is. It's better than not looking at the road, but then of course how exactly do you place those items? Do you is this a game where somehow these things are moving along and you kind of have to follow the road or is it just simply a piece of you know like a window that you're focusing on and then does that how much does that help I don't, I don't think that we know the answer or at least I don't know the answer to that um, we did have a an interesting Kai workshop a couple years ago on what we can learn from other dis other fields in terms of automation and what what's it, what its effects are and I think that people say well you, you can learn a lot from aviation because aviation went through this, right? Planes are automated to a large extent, and of course, we, here we have. I think that's a little bit of a stretch because planes, there's just more time, right? Things are kind of distant, and then they move fast, but there's just a lot of space, and it's 3D, so you can do things. It, there isn't like the, unless you respond in two seconds, you're dead. And the skill of the operator is... And then they're trained, right? 
But one thing is true, there is this so-called de-skilling, which is now a verb apparently. So a lot, lo having, you know, losing skills is definitely something that does happen to pilots. And so then, are we going to get trained? I, that's actually a really good one, right? Are consumers going to accept? I mean, is there going to be a mandate from governments that says you shall, not only are we going to look at your vision, we're going to actually put you in a simulator like we did with pilots, and then we're going to find out if you can take back over. And that's clearly, uh, to your point, right, that if things are difficult for the car, then it's difficult for everybody. Well, that's exactly where you're going to be taking over. So you're taking over at this difficult point in time. And so I, I don't have an answer to that. And I think people are debating. What do you do about driver's education? Does, does this continue throughout your life? And how does that, how is that actually implemented? Um, it's, it's like this in aviation. You can't slow down to a full stop. Yeah. But in a car, you can slow down to a full stop. Sure. So maybe that is the best option. Yeah, that's true. So you can stop. I think the, the one tricky part about it is for everybody else to stop before they hit you if you're right so for you that, that's the current solution right so I have a uh, I think my vehicle would do this so it has this low it, at low speeds it would take over you know both steering and uh, and the uh, acceleration and I think if I don't manipulate the steering wheel every so f a few seconds I think it'll actually stop but you know, if I stop on a busy highway in the morning, that's also a tricky scenario, right? Especially if people are moving relatively fast. So I don't know what to say about that. I think it's a little tricky to just simply stop. Maybe pulling over. Uh, yeah. Uh, hi, thank you for coming. It's great. Thanks. Um, I am working, actually, we are working on a project called Electronic Vertical Takeoff and Landing. Wow. So um, we're more concerned about cabin design interiors. Yeah. But one of my biggest concerns, because these people in these sort of air taxis yeah. will not need to be. They are not going to drive these things. They'll be remote pilots. Got it. Um, so that's not my concern. My biggest concern would be the social acceptance of it. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering in your enter study if anything came up about the social acceptance of a fully automated vehicle. I, for one, love driving, so I hope this doesn't come to fruition. But sure. I can imagine that the social acceptance might be a bit of a roadblock. Yeah. Um, we didn't ask questions that would be appropriate for us, so I, I cannot tell you that. I th but just as a, you know, Asimov's books do have a lot of truth to them, and people are not happy with robots. They are afraid of automation. So we, we were at a, a workshop where uh, the same funding agency uh, funds various types of future of work and uh, wor uh, types of uh, research and one of them was about uh, uh, work on farms and it was just like a person stepped out of his book complaining about robots on a farm. No robots on my farm ever. No way, right? So that's true. To your point about loving driving, I fully agree when I look at car commercials that are, you know, the beautiful coastline and all that, and I completely disagree with you when I'm driving this morning to, to Boston, telling I have to leave at 545, otherwise I'm not going to make my plane, and that's, you know, I, I'm not loving it. I'd much rather not have that, and especially day by day. So I think that there will be a way to, to, to have people enjoy driving, but my guess is that that's going to be more like we enjoy horseback riding. You know, so that's my opinion. But we, you know, we don't have those cars yet, so we don't have. We can disagree freely and uh, <laughs> ask people on Turk. <laughs> I just had one observation, which is we talked about automation making driving simpler. Yeah. Um, and one of the interesting paradoxes is, is that, in fact, a lot of automation uh, makes things actually more difficult. Yeah. Because now you have to supervise yeah. not only the car but also the system that's driving the car. Yeah. You now you have a far more complex system to understand and, and control. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> control. So I wonder if you thought, uh, if, if you have any thoughts you could share on um, the increasing complexity of automated systems and how that will affect the driving task that we're asking people to do. I, um, I think that th that goes back to what types of tasks are appropriate. And uh, again, you cannot fall asleep. 
So for example, one reason that people are really bad at supervision is they do fall asleep, right? It's just so boring. You, so if, if your role is to watch for the car to tell you that now you need to drive, that's, I don't, I, that's probably, uh, you know, that's a recipe for disaster. And so the question is, what exactly is it that isn't a recipe for disaster, right? So I think a lot of these examples, to my understanding, are literally people are sitting and watching, is this light bulb going to go off because that means my nuclear power plant is overheating. But that's not the case here. It's more of a, I'm doing something and then someone taps me on the shoulder and says, you know what, you have 30 seconds. So stop this and now go over to this. So I think that's a, that's a scenario that's uh, closer to something that is doable. You can still mess this up, I think, really badly. For example, by, you know, are people going to not fall asleep? What else are people going to do? I mean, people today fall asleep in Teslas. We see that, right? And Teslas are not even level three. They're not supposed to be anyway. They're supposed to be. Uh, so I, I don't think that's an easy question to answer. But, uh, you know, Teslas also, to some extent, get a bad reputation in the sense of someone died in a Tesla. How many people died in a Ford? <laughs> today. How many people were saved? Yeah. We don't know how many people are falling asleep driving normally. Exactly. So, exactly. So it's not, know, but, I mean, not, not a fair comparison, yeah. yeah. Just to your point, one thing I'd like to point out is that the recent 737 maps yeah. are aware the automation drove the airplane uh, beyond the capabilities of the pilots to yeah. respond. Uh, and part of that difficulty were the new automated systems that are uh, overlaid on the fundamental stability and control systems that are in the vehicle. I, th I think that um, my understanding of the MAX, uh, the 737 MAX, is that there, there is definitely, it might be that people with some level of skills are okay flying planes that are automated, but a failure ends up being catastrophic. The same failure, for example, in I think Ethiopia happened the day before and the person managed to ha handle it. My father-in-law was an airline pilot and he says, oh yeah, when that happens, this is what you do. So, right, so where is that training? And I think that goes back to your question too about, well, do, do you lose that, <laughs> right? And maybe you do because that just doesn't happen because the thing is automated, you don't have to do that. But I'm kind of curious about the entry point. So can you now fly planes more easily because they're automated, but they still sometimes lose that automation and you're actually not good enough at this level. And you never were. It's not that you lost it, you just never had it to begin with. So it's a little, but I think that's really interesting and, and definitely a relevant issue for cars. Yeah, did you, did you have a, no, sorry. Yeah. Question around the, the topics that were put forward, what people were looking at working in cars. Um, I'm wondering if the data set is, I can say it, biased. Yeah. If everything on the list was a knowledge worker. If 10% of the people say programming, yeah. that's, that's us university geeks. I yeah. put myself in that category, right, versus it being the mass large yeah. population. And I, I'm sorry, I probably didn't mention, but yes, it was biased to knowledge workers. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, because uh, one place that we expect to see a, a possible impact is, is with those people. So yes, thank you for winning that out. And the other observation about the thing is the mixed mode is also what scares me as we uh -huh. automated and not automated. Yeah. His History has shown new features take three to four decades to go across the fleet and see wide per wide scale deployment. Mm -hmm. So we're 30 to 40 years from Tesla level two yeah. being in mass use in the marketplace. Yeah. Let alone level three, level four, we haven't seen yet. There's some really interesting uh, work on how automated vehicles, you know, like the Google version of automated vehicles interacts with actual humans or Teslas. And uh, there are definitely misunderstandings, so. Yeah. Yeah. What if we were to take the best of aviation and the best of this technology of auto autonomous mm -hmm. vehicles and just have drones? They don't have obstacles, they don't have pedestrians, yeah. they don't have cyclists, just have drones. Yeah, well, that's the... I'm coming. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, thank you.